Hi everyone, my name is Warren Isaac Berry from Beer Science Lab, and welcome back to Quantum Mechanics. Today, we'll be talking about Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. Now, we had an informal introduction um, a few lectures ago, but what does Heisenberg's uncertainty principle actually tell us mathematically? The vague idea isn't enough to define a physical law. But, I mean, first, we need the vague idea in order to start working towards the physical law statement. So, what does it tell us? Well, essentially, it tells us the more you know the position of an object, the less you will know about its momentum. Or the mo more you know about the momentum of an object, the less you will know about its position. What does that actually mean? Well, if you take a particle and measure it many times, there's no way to know the position and momentum other than measuring it, which you can do with your eye, with a meter stick, with a microscope. Any observation is a measurement. And once you conclude that measurement, your measurements for position and your measurements for momentum will both be as accurate as possible. They'll both be of the same accuracy. They'll have the same number of decimal places and everything. But while if the measurements of position are consistent, the measurements for momentum are going to be totally inconsistent. They're going to have a variation all over the place. They're going to be very far from the mean. What does that mean? Well, that means they have high variance. Meanwhile, the position measurements will have a low variance. So, apparently, if one has low variance, the other will have high variance, and if one has high variance, the other will have low variance. So, you can't decrease the variance of one at some point without increasing the variance of the other. That's what the uncertainty principle is telling us. So how do we formalize that? Well, it all comes down to this equation. If your measurements are perfectly accurate, you can know no more than this. That's h bar. So if the variance of one goes down, which is good, the variance of the other goes up, which is bad. So how do we actually prove this? Well, first, what exactly is variance? You hopefully already know that. Variance, if we define it by the square method, is just the square root of the mean distance This is the expected value of the mean distance from of a particular result to the mean squared. So there it is, that standard deviation. So how do we represent this in quantum mechanics? Well, it's all through bracket notation or bracket notation. So, we write this in bracket notation as there's a square in here, which for complex numbers is very similar to taking the inner product of something with itself. So, this is going to be, well, this mean is going to be a hat, and the variable itself is going to be a. Operating on the wave function, and we're going to take the inner product of that one itself to obtain the square. Now, if we're talking about position in specific, this is going to be position operator multiplied by, or minus position, multiplied by psi. And for momentum, similarly, you're going to have the momentum operator over here. And this is the perfect time to use the Cauchy scores here. The Cauchy scores are equality, which tells us that. Give me a few seconds for making transition.
Norming is very useful for putting an upper bound on the dot product. F dot G has to be less than or equal to their norms multiplied together. And that makes sense once you learn to prove that the dot product is just the norms multiplied together times cosine theta, which cannot ever be greater than 1. So, here it's not quite the same as this, because there's no such thing as an angle between functions. But the cauchy schwarz inequality still holds. So, what is the norm here? Well, this is just going to be the square root of the square root of f dot f and the square root of g dot g. That's what the norm is defined as. And that's got to be greater than or equal to their product. If you square both sides, like we need to do here, you get that. This is less than f dot f, g dot g. Now, why do we need to square both sides? Well, if we multiply these two together, we'll get that. This multiplied by this, we're going to abbreviate this as f and this is g because it's too funky to write right now. This is just going to be f dot f, g dot g which is greater than or equal to f dot g squared by this logic. So, we now have this relation, but can we go any deeper? This still isn't what we want yet. Well, in fact we can't. What exactly is inside f dot g squared? Well, Recall that f dot g is some complex number, and so its modulus squared has to be greater than or equal to its imaginary part squared, given this is equal to both its real part squared plus its imaginary part squared, and this cannot be negative. So since this is true, well, what can we know? What is the imaginary part? That's just the imaginary part of some number z is z minus its conjugate over 2i. And recall why this is. z is a plus bi, z conjugate is a minus bi. And so if you want to just obtain b, Subtracting them cancels out the real parts, and then you get 2bi, and you want to cancel out the 2i factor, so you add that denominator right there to get b. So then you've got to square that. And by the inner product axioms, the conjugate of f dot g is g dot f. Now, how do we approach this? Well, what is f dot g? You get x hat minus x psi. multiplied by p hat minus p psi. So how do we actually go about writing this out? Well, we use the distributive property. So this becomes psi minus psi minus psi plus, and at this point, using the property that, oh, sorry, I forgot to multiply the psi's, using the property that psi dot psi has to be 1 by one statistical interpretation, that forces this to just be equal to x p minus p x with the operators. So what do we do with this? 
Well, this is the commutator in its most general form. But, oh, sorry. This is OP. Now, in general form, this is the commutator. But specifically, we can do a lot more with this. Now, to figure out what this is, we're going to test it out on some function, f, and see what happens when we apply it to f. Well, we get, since this is h over i partial x, this is going to give us x hat h over i partial x f minus h over i partial x x f. And what happens here? Well, you factor out the h over i, then you get x partial xf minus, well, this is just the product rule, so you get f minus x partial xf. And so you cancel these two out, and you get that it's just, well, minus 1 over i is i, so you get that this is i, oh, this is h bar. You get i h bar f, which means that this guy on top is just i h bar, Remember, we were multiplying it by a test function. That's why the extra f is there. And so we cancel out the two i's, which means what, whatever's left over is a strictly positive number. And you get that the standard deviation of x multiplied by p has to be greater than or equal to h bar over 2 squared. And so since both of these have to be strictly positive under the squares, we don't have to insert a plus minus, and we can say this is true. And of course, that means that there's a hard limit to how precise and reliable your measurements can be. That's the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Thanks everyone for watching. Say some history of Heisenberg uncertainty so no. for a few seconds. Um, what year he won the Nobel Prize? Well, yeah, of course. He, uh, he discovered the, uh, Heisenberg discovered the uncertainty principle in 1927. And he won a Nobel Prize for discoveries at 1932 uh, at the age of 31, which is pretty young for a Nobel Prize laureate. Um, it's a very difficult discovery to make, especially since, you know, none of this is in standardized textbooks like it is nowadays. This was at the front line of physics a few years ago. Well, not a few years ago, 80 years ago, 90 years ago. Uh, physics education was very not standardized. And, you know, this was an extreme innovation for somebody to come up with all on their own. Nowadays, it can be encapsulated in a 15-minute lecture, but it took years of work from Heisenberg just to come up with this. And this is just one part of the generalized uncertainty principle anyhow. So that's it for today. Thanks, everyone, for watching. We'll see you in the next one.